फ्रेंड्स वी आर स्टार्टिंग नाउ टुडे इज हंड्रेड एंड सिक्सटी सेवेंथ फ्राइडे ग्रूप मीटिंग द टॉपिक इज द लॉ ऑफ फैक्ट्स द स्पीकर इज मिस्टर जयदीप गुप्ता सीनियर एडवोकेट वन ऑफ द प्रोमिनेंट टॉप मोस्ट कमर्शियल लॉयर एंड अदर सिविल लॉयर आर्बिट्रेशन लॉयर सर आल्सो एड्रेस्ड एलियर टाइम्स दैट इज लेवेंथ फ्राइडे ग्रूप मीटिंग दैट इज एटीन सेप्टेम्बर टू थाउजेंड फिफ्टीन डेवलपमेंट्स इन and second 17th september 2016 that is the first annual meet the topic was that time the several speakers the birth sir choose uh, independence of uh, the birth of independence sir uh, the third is 13th for 2018 that is 77th friday group meeting commercial courts act after that now this is a uh, today's meeting sir this uh, uh, shall we go for introduction sir yes sesh girra please mm-hmm. meet प्रेम सिंह जी डी गणमत प्रसून कुमार मिश्रा एम असलम देव देवी कृष्ण शर्मा राहुल अग्रवाल सिंह राहुल शर्मा जय प्रकाश कुमार अक्षय यू कैन आज If anybody, please. You go on, please. Now, sir, sir. Yes. So the, as you can see, the topic was chosen to develop some interest in today's session because in our day-to-day uh, practice of the law, we tend to think of facts as something opposed to law. but because we are practicing in the highest court in the country most of the time we tend to forget that the primary job of a lawyer and an adjudicator i'll use the general word adjudicator because that would include judges as well as heads of tribunals etc and please uh, excuse my voice it's not in a very good condition so uh, lawyers and adjudicators first of all and primarily are required to grapple with facts the first and most important job of a lawyer or an adjudicator is to see what are the facts if facts are admitted there is no difficulty but as everybody knows facts are rarely admitted and even if they are admitted they are admitted only to some extent and subject to lot of caveats so it is the first and most important job of a lawyer to train himself or herself to assess and evaluate facts now nothing in our sphere of activity is done on an ad hoc basis everything is done in accordance with principles and these principles when they reach a certain level of finality or uh, or acceptability they become legal principles once you accept that this is a principle which will be followed by lawyers and adjudicators it becomes a legal principle so the assessment of facts also has its own share of legal principles which are required to be applied and this only makes our job possible because otherwise how would you assess facts now you can go simply by your intuition you can go simply by your intuition which is what most people do outside the law courts outside the law class but obviously that kind of lay approach to facts is not adequate for lawyers and judges so we have to assess facts and in order to assess facts 
we have to find principles by which we will assess facts and these principles are what we might call the law relating to or of facts now this is not such an esoteric subject as you might think the primary source of the law of facts is the evidence act in india or the common law of evidence in anglo american jurisprudence i am not very familiar with continental jurisprudence but they have their own set of rules by which they assess facts and mostly it is within the subject of evidence i will today focus on three aspects the first aspect is everybody has to first be very careful in identifying what is or is not a fact it is not obvious at all it is not obvious what is a fact because there are so many things which masquerade as facts which are not facts some of these non facts have been included amongst facts by a deeming provision in some law or the other but nonetheless they are not facts an opinion is not a fact but when i say this i have to be careful because in a litigation or in a cause let's use the word cause which is more general than litigation there can be a cause even before it becomes a litigation when there is a dispute between two parties uh the if the parties hold an opinion the opinion is not a fact it is a fact that he own, uh, holds that opinion but his opinion is not a fact our evidence act and this is based on rules of common law say that a third party expert if he gives an opinion then you are to treat it as a fact this is an example of what is not a fact but which will be treated by a lawyer as a fact and a an opinion given by an expert on certain matters in which he is an expert but the opinion of a non expert or the opinion of a party is not a fact except to the extent that he holds the opinion let's now take an example of something which is obviously not a fact but which by by application of principles of law are treated as facts foreign law is obviously law but in every domestic jurisdiction foreign law is treated as a question of fact so if today a question arises in an indian forum as to what is the law relating to a particular contract which was governed by the law of uk then it has to be proved as a fact so therefore these are some examples to introduce the idea that what is or is not a fact is something that particular attention has to be paid to a lawyer does not have the uh, luxury of being casual or being vague about these concepts and therefore it is important to realize that what is a fact is a question of law 
legal principles have to be applied in order to figure out what is or is not a fact. <clears throat> if you are confronted with a cause, as I have used the term, if you are confronted with a cause, your very first effort must be, obviously, to ascertain the facts. And in order to ascertain facts, you may have to apply certain principles of law. What is recognized by law as being a fact? This is the first aspect of what I am calling the law of facts. The second aspect is how do you how do you ascertain it? How do you prove it? Now, this also is dealt with very carefully by our Evidence Act. And there is no reason why we should not focus directly on that. In this context, today, there is a certain amount of inattention or lack of attention which is paid to the law of evidence on the theory that it is we needn't rely on it strictly there are certain areas in which the law of evidence is strictly applied still in any civil proceedings in a court of law in any criminal proceedings in a court of law the law of evidence is strictly applied even by the definitions of the Evidence Act, it is not to be strictly applied in arbitration. It may or may not be strictly applied in a tribunal proceedings. But when you say that, oh, let's not think about the law of evidence because it does not always apply, it is important to realize that it is after all an aid all these principles contained in the evidence act and elsewhere are all aids in the assessment of facts one of the toughest jobs in the legal profession is to assess facts if you don't have any assistance from anywhere you will make the same you will make the same mistake as a layman makes which is to intuitively assess facts so therefore, even if you are not required to apply the law of evidence, it is important to recognize that the principles in the Evidence Act are excellent guides to how to assess facts. Because they are the subject matter of decades and centuries of thinking on how facts are to be assessed. The Indian Evidence Act, by the way, contains illustrations. Now those illustrations are themselves amazing ways of understanding how to appreciate facts. If you don't treat it as a principle of law, treat it as some illustration. Those illustrations are very valuable in, the, in, any, in any assessment. The Indian Evidence Act <coughs> is, or at, at, at least was, the codification of the English Common Law of Evidence, carried out by a gentleman called Stephen, in the, and which, which was accepted as the law in India in 1872. The interesting story is that Mr. Stephen, who was a brilliant academic, had codified the law of you of the common law of United Kingdom for the purpose of codification of English law. But he could not get people to agree to codify it. English lawyers are notoriously averse, or were at least till some time back, notoriously averse 
to statutory statements of the law. They preferred the flexibility of common law which meant that <coughs> judges would read and figure out what are principles of law and then they would apply those. Future judges would come forward and say, I want to change this. This is the next logical step in the development of the law, etc., etc. This is our common law procedure. And by and large, an English lawyer's training was to prefer that flexibility to the inflexibility of putting it down in the form of a statute. But they themselves acknowledged that just across the waters, the entire European continent believed in codifying their law. So the entire continental jurisprudence is based, by and large, on an original code which was called the Napoleonic Code, which has of course changed dramatically over the centuries and decades. But they believed in writing it down and codifying it. Interestingly, when they came to, say, India, the English lawyers themselves said that in this situation it would be better to codify it not leave it to the development of common law, but let us codify it. And then when they codified it, they added illustrations. They added illustrations so that it became, each act almost became a complete textbook in itself. Because many of the examples that they gave were actually the facts taken from decided cases. Contract Act has illustrations. Evidence Act has illustrations. These illustrations were mostly taken from reported cases. So it made things so much more easier. Instead of citing a judgment before, let us say, a district judge, if you could just say, look at section such and such and the illustration be under it, then it was that much simpler. So this is why they put illustrations in it. And these illustrations are excellent ways in which we can appreciate facts and we can adjudicate on facts. So, now in this context, if you now look at this, I'll show you small portions of it only to illustrate the point. Fact is defined to mean and include from, Indian Evidence Act. from the Indian Evidence Act. Fact is defined to mean and include. Means and includes is considered to be an expansive definition. Anything, state of things or relation of things capable of being perceived by the senses. What a human being can perceive by their senses. And any mental condition of which a person is conscious. Then they go on to illustrations. That a man heard or saw something is a fact. That a man said something is a fact. There are certain objects are arranged in a certain order in a certain place is a fact. So they give illustrations of what is a fact. Now, I, was, I only digressed as to the importance of the Evidence Act not only because it is directly applicable as a statute in certain situations, but also because it is an aid. It is an aid in any kind of adjudicatory process only to show that these principles are still relevant. Now, Somebody says while doing an arbitration that, forget the evidence, it says, section 1, subsection 3 says, it shall not apply to evidence, but, uh, will not apply to arbitration, but despite that, there are judgments which say that principles of natural justice will be applicable to arbitrations. And many of the principles contained in our Code of Civil Procedure and in the evidence are such principles of natural justice. Because natural justice is also a mechanism by which you assess 
or true facts. So therefore, ultimately, many of the principles contained in the Evidence Act, even when they are not strictly applicable, are important to understand and the need to understand it doesn't go away because we are sitting in the Supreme Court of India. The Supreme Court of India purports not to decide or re-decide questions of facts. But nonetheless, without an understanding of the underlying law of facts, nobody can practice even in an appellate court. So, facts are primarily assessed, taken and assessed by the trial court. According to the civil procedure code, they can be completely reassessed by a first appellate court. They are not to be reassessed further by the second appellate court. And certainly they are not to be reassessed in the Supreme Court. But without your understanding of the assessment of the facts, no lawyer can make any headway or understand what is going on, even in the appellate court. So let us get rid of the idea that we in the appellate forum or the final appellate forum in this country do not need to understand the underlying basis of the law of evidence and the law of facts. So therefore, it is important to get to grips with the law of facts, by which I mean various aspects of the law of evidence itself. <coughs> now, how do you use facts? You use facts by first introducing it into the body of evidence which the judge is to consider. So when you are analyzing a case for the purpose of presentation, you have to figure out what is it that you must bring on record? What facts? Because if you don't bring those facts on record, then the judge can do nothing with those facts. Certain facts are forgotten, left out of the record, end of the matter. So therefore, when planning out the litigation or the cause or any kind of proceedings, one must necessarily un ask oneself which are the facts that we wish to bring on record. <coughs> there is one area which I am not so keen to get into today. What are the kinds of facts which need to be proved in a litigation is, some, is an area that I don't wish to get into too much. It's a very complicated process. Roughly stated, Um, people have rights and obligations, right? And courts decide what those rights and obligations are if a dispute arises. That's what a court usually does. It might be a private right, like under a contract. It can be a public right, like under a statute. It can be any kind of right, or it can be an obligation. Obligation not to commit nuisance in somebody else's uh, property, etc. So, a, a legal cause usually deals with rights and obligations. Now, the existence of certain facts gives rise to those rights and obligations. So, therefore, if we are trying to enforce a particular right or a particular obligation, in that event, we have to prove certain facts. Roughly stated, the Evidence Act says that there are facts in issue, meaning those facts which are necessary to prove that right or prove that obligation. And there are relevant facts, that is facts which are relevant to facts in issue. Relevant in the sense that they are connected to those. Connected in a way that helps the court to take a decision, not connected generally. This is a very, very complex area as to what has to be proved in order to get from one point to another point. And it is 
more complicated because it depends on the nature of cause of action that you are ex trying to exercise. So in every contractual situation, there is a different kind of fact which has to be proved. In every tortious situation, there are different kinds of facts. In every criminal law situation, there are different <coughs> kinds of facts. So therefore, it becomes little difficult to make any abstract comments on this area of the law. I therefore want to move on to the next stage, which is how do you prove, you decide to, for yourself that I need to prove these facts. Um, small, uh, a small uh, additional piece of information here because it's relevant for everybody in this courtroom. The West Law series, which produces um, American jurisprudence, etc., etc., the big encyclopedias of American law, also produces a whole encyclopedic series called the Proof of Facts. And what they do is, they take each given situation, let us say a contract for enforcement of uh, the price for a goods which have been sold. It takes that situation and lists what are the facts which you need to prove. It takes hundreds and hundreds of such situations and tells you what are the facts that you need to prove. This is done in an encyclopedia called Proof of Facts. And one copy of that encyclopedia of, of proof of facts is going to utter waste in this building because it was presented to the Supreme Court Bar Association by a very eminent lawyer. And nobody expressed any interest in it. So it is lying in the, in the shelves next to the conference cubicles. If you go to the conference cubicles, there are some green books lying there. That is that encyclopedia of proof of facts. It's almost impossible to lay your hands on that encyclopedia, even if you want it. It's just lying there, nobody goes and checks it. Just as an aside. So if you need to know what facts I should prove, if I want to file a suit to do X, Y or Z, to let us say to stop somebody from um, uh, walking around on my garden, then you can go to that encyclopedia and find out a list, one, two, three, four, five. These are the facts which have been proved. So, it's too vast a topic for any one particular discussion. So, let us go on to the next part, which one can discuss in short, because they apply to all facts. How do we introduce facts into evidence? That is the that is the area of proof of facts. Proof of facts is again dealt with by the evidence act. And what it says is that every fact has to be proved by a person who knows it. And I'll shortly come to some misconceptions we have in this regard. But just let us see. <coughs> Part 2 of this Evidence Act is on proof, correct? Then the first part of that part is what doesn't have to be proved. Facts judicially noticeable doesn't have to be proved, then list of facts which are judicially noticeable. But what about those facts which have to be proved? For that, what section 59 states is, all facts except the contents of documents or electronic records may be proved by oral evidence. Now, please note that everything requires oral evidence except what contents of documents. Contents of documents. Contents of documents means what does a document contain? That's all. So a letter is a document written to somebody to say 
that let us say a letter says that I met you on such and such day we had this conversation and you assured me that you will do this this is a letter what are the contents of the letter the contents of the letter is I met you on such and such day I had a conversation with you you told me this this is the content of the document but is it true is it a fact that I met him on that day is it a fact that there was a conversation is it a fact that such and such assurance was given answer is merely by proving that document that is not established so even though even in our courtrooms even all of us even judges say that there is oral evidence and there is documentary evidence there is only actually oral evidence the documentary evidence is only limited to finding out what a document contains contents of a document this document does contain this that a document contains something is not a proof of the fact that is stated in that document now i cannot tell you how many affidavits we file that i have seen completely ignores this aspect of the matter it says by such and such document it was stated so finished here is the document idea is i have given you the document what more do you want not one more word in that affidavit if the witness is being examined in the box then the witness says nothing more than that here is the document but what is this that our act says our act says that he saw something it will not be accepted as evidence of the fact that he actually saw it he says he saw it fine proved did he see it i can't say that he saw it because he told me that he saw it he can come to the box and say i saw it then it becomes evidence but i who have heard him say that he saw it cannot prove it so therefore it must be direct direct means if the if it is important to assess whether he saw it or not then he must speak take a very common example i saw somebody hitting somebody else i can go to the box and prove it prove it orally direct evidence somebody has told me that he saw him hitting somebody can't be if it can it, it falls foul of the directness of the oral evidence now this allows me to illustrate why i am saying that these very principles whether they are applicable as a statute or not is equally important in assessing the importance of uh, in assessing the correctness of the fact would you believe who would you believe as a layman who would you believe the man who says i saw it or the man who says he told me that he saw it who will you believe now leave aside the law of hearsay leave aside section 60 of the indian evidence act you will say to yourself that i will believe the man who says he saw it and not the man who says that somebody told me that he had seen him do it so it's common sense also it's a principle which would appeal to you as a human being also as a person even as a lay person it will appeal to you so therefore if you told told me that oh section 60 is not applicable in an arbitration proceedings so oral evidence can be anything will you accept that answer is no why won't you accept it because it would be much better if you could hear the man who actually saw it so what would the adjudicator say the adjudicator will say that where is this fellow who saw it now i can say that i don't know where he is i can't find him anymore there is a solution for that even under the evidence act there is a solution for that but if i say that he is working in my office 
then the adjudicator will say, would it not be better if you brought him along? And there is no answer to that question. It would be better. Because when he comes, you will probe a little bit more. You will say you saw it, well, when did you see it? At 12 o'clock in the night. Well, how much light was there? Not much light. Then would I believe him? No. Or I would not trust his statement. But suppose he says, I saw it in broad daylight in front of me at 12 o'clock in the daytime. Then I would believe it. This information could not have come in an indirect fashion. The indirect man, if he is told, when did he see it? He said, I don't know. He didn't say when he saw it. <coughs> what was the light conditions like? I don't know. He didn't tell me what the light conditions were. So therefore, oral evidence is the principal evidence. And anybody who says to the contrary has misunderstood the law of evidence. Number two, oral evidence has to be direct. Because it is more believable if it is direct. It is safer to rely on the man who saw it than to rely on the man who says somebody said he saw it. So if it refers to a fact which could be heard, it must be the evidence of the witness who heard it. If it refers to a fact which could be perceived by any other sense or in any other manner, it must be the evidence of a witness who says he perceived it by that sense or in that manner. Taste, let us say. If it refers to an opinion or to the grounds on which the opinion is held, it must be the evidence of the person who holds that opinion on those grounds. Otherwise, how will you test it? I am not getting into exceptions. Huh? We'll let, us under, let us concentrate on the broad principle here. Exception, for instance, is that if the opinion is found in a accepted textbook, the court can give it some weightage without calling the author of that textbook, particularly if the author is dead. So we keep talking about, you know, this famous book in India where forensic, for forensic criminal purposes, blood stains, etc., etc. Now that gentleman is no longer alive, but you keep citing his book. That is allowed. But normally speaking, the, was the expert who is giving the opinion has to be produced in order to accept that evidence of his. So it has to be direct. And again, I repeat, it is not only has to be direct because the evidence act says so, but because the normal presumption of safeness of evidence depends upon talking to the person who has actually seen it. Direct. Now, everything is oral, except contents of documents. For that, 61 says, the contents of documents may be proved either by primary or secondary evidence. Oral evidence cannot be proved by primary and secondary evidence in that sense. But the contents of a document may be proved either by primary or secondary evidence. Primary is what? Produce the document. Show it to the judge, that letter that I spoke of, here is the letter, my lord just take a look at it, he looks at it, he reads it. Now, that's section 61. If we come to section 66, you will find, sorry, not 66, <coughs> um, uh, 67. 67. How do you prove the contents of a document? You have produced it. That's number one. But now, how do you authenticate it? In order to authenticate it, you look at the writing. You look at the writing. If it is wholly in writing, then it must be proved that it is the writing of the person. If it is only signed, typewritten letter, only signed, then that signature has to be established. So 67 is telling us that if a document is alleged to be signed or to have been written wholly or in part by a person, 
the signature or the handwriting or so much of the document as is alleged to be in that person's handwriting must be proved to be his handwriting. Now I can prove handwriting in various ways. I can call him. He'll come and say, yes, this is my handwriting. I can call his, maybe his boss, who will say, yes, I see hundreds of letters written by him every day. I know this is his handwriting. If you can't, you can call an expert to say this is his handwriting. But you have to prove the handwriting. Either wholly or if the document is wholly in handwriting or partly in handwriting. So this is how you will prove a document in a primary manner. Because it says that a document, contents of a document may be proved either pri by primary or secondary evidence. This is primary evidence. Secondary evidence is when the document itself cannot be produced for some reason. Then there are special ways of proving secondary by secondary evidence, but that also only takes us only so far as to say that this document said this. It says nothing more. So secondary evidence is section 63. A certified copy is a secondary evidence. Then um, copies made by made from the original by mechanical processes which ensures accuracy is a secondary evidence. Copies made and compared with the original, these are secondary evidence, counterparts, even oral account of the content of documents given by a person who has seen it, all listed in section 63. But then comes the rider in section 65 as to when you can give secondary evidence. So if the document cannot be produced for certain reasons, then you can give secondary evidence. Or if the facts which are sought to be proved is contained in a document which is very voluminous, then you can give the evidence of a person who says, I have gone through this entire set of documents and this is the correct summary of it. Like for instance, I have gone through the entire accounts, I, I understand accounts, I have read everything in that document, I, I can guarantee that in the end it says so much is due. So I don't need to bring that whole document into evidence. So that's secondary evidence. But again, secondary evidence of what? Contents of the document. What has it not proved? It has not proved the truth of the contents. So, evidence has to be led, oral evidence has to be led of the truth of the contents of documents. Now, people who practice in trial courts day in and day out would not require much <coughs> persuasion to understand this. But we do not practice on a day-to-day -day basis in a trial court, so we, will, we might be subject to some uh, confusion in this regard. Truth of the contents of documents is very often not proved in most situations because nobody is paying attention to the fact that by producing the document you only show that the document says what it says. It does not show that it is correct. So therefore, <coughs> truth of the contents of documents has to be independently proved. There is only these are prob problems with this is that if you ask a trial court lawyer, he will say it's obvious. But what if a judge asks you, sh show me authority? Then you are stuck. You can't produce the trial court lawyer. The absolute basics of our law is often not in a, found in a judgment. But fortunately, this particular aspect which I am at pains to explain and try to get everybody to realize that we are there is a lacuna is in a judgment. It is not a Supreme Court judgment. It is a very well written judgment and if you, if you take no notes today except to note down this citation, you would have gone, gone away with something very significant. It is All India Reporter 1983, Bombay, page 1. Very easy to remember also. 83 page 1 Om Prakash Barlia 
versus Unit Trust of India or whatever. Justice Barucha, our former Chief Justice, sitting as a single judge, has written this all down in such a way that you will never make an error about this ever again. And I will take the liberty of reading it. Because this one judgment could save us so much time in a trial that it's not funny. Section 63 states that secondary evidence <coughs> includes an oral account of the contents of a document given by some person who has seen it. That person does not give evidence of the truth of the contents of the documents merely by reason of having seen it, but of what he saw. In section 63, therefore, the expression contents of a document must mean only what the document states. Section 61 prove, provides that the contents of a document may be proved either by primary or secondary <coughs> evidence. The expression in 61 must therefore also mean what the document states and not the truth of what the document states. Secondly, section 61 and 62 read together show that the contents of the document must primarily be proved by the production of the document itself for the inspection of the court. The truth of the contents of the document even prima facie cannot be proved by merely producing the document for inspection of the court. Why then do so many of our judges say they will rely only on documentary evidence? They are wrong. Documentary evidence is only proving that this is not an afterthought. It was said then only. That's all it is proving. The truth of the contents of the document requires oral evidence. And therefore, it is consistently wrong for an adjudicator to, uh, to say that, oh, that's oral evidence. This is documentary evidence, this is sacrosanct. It's consistently wrong for them to say that. What they should be saying is that if there is a document which records this, it improves my trust. It makes me believe that it is not an afterthought. You didn't write this up in the plaint for the first time. You said the same thing in a document at that date, on that date, nearer to the date. So that I put it down in a document is an important thing. But it is by itself not even prima facie evidence of the truth of the contents of the document. So the truth of the contents of the document, even prima facie, cannot be proved by merely producing the document for the inspection of the court. What it states can be so established. Then, thirdly, the writer of a document is required to depose to the truth of its contents. Fourthly, section 67 of the Act requires the proof of the handwriting or signature upon the document. If by mere production of the original document for the inspection of the court, the truth of its contents was proved prima facie, the requirement of proof of handwriting and signature would be almost superfluous. The Act requires first the production of the original document. If the original document is not available, secondary evidence may be given. This is to prove what the document states. Upon this, the document becomes admissible except where it is signed or handwritten, only or in part. In such a case, the second requirement is under section 67 that signature and handwriting must be proved. Further, where the party tendering the document finds it necessary to prove the truth of its contents, that is the truth of what it states, he must do so in the manner he would prove a relevant fact. What is that manner? Section 60, oral evidence. And what is the oral evidence? I say that it is true. So I here's the document. The document says all this. I was present. I am saying that I know that these statements are true. So going back to the letter that we discussed, that on such and such date I met you, we had a conversation, and you assured me in this fashion. This must come by way of a contents of documents. Here is the document, this is the letter. But the man must come and say, 
whatever I have said in this letter is correct. That's oral evidence. Four stages. Unfortunately for us, there is at least one judgment which clearly says so. It relies on Supreme Court. Ramji Dayawala's case in 1971 does contain some of these elements. It's not very clear. But Justice Barucha's judgment in Om Prakash Barliya is very clear. So, if you are doing a trial, this judgment should be in your file all the time. And if ever you need to explain what is it that the Evidence Act requires, and then finally comes the stage where even the Evidence Act is not a must. But even then, what would really, really, really satisfy a tribunal? By the way, there is a, there is a statement of best evidence always. If the best evidence is available, it is no good producing the second best evidence. So, a proper adjudicator will say that can you not produce the fellow who wrote this letter? You will say, yes I can, produce him, finished. No doubts left. You say, no I can't produce him, then he will say that, do you know any of these facts? He can say, I do know these facts. So Suppose somebody else was in that room and he comes forward and says, yes, they did meet on that day. They did have this conversation, this assurance was given. Then that man will say, yes, I, I am speaking to the truth of the contents of this document. Now, if till such time, this is just a technicality, till such time as a, the truth of the documents, the contents of the documents are not established, a judge is strictly speaking supposed to mark that document and keep it aside, not exhibit. If the document has both been proved and the truth of its contents have been proved, it can straight away be marked as an exhibit. But what is the practice of trial courts is that if the co contents of the document is there but it has not been proved fully, in that event it is kept as marked for identification. And marked for identification only means that at a later stage it will get proved. Some other witness will come and say, I know the truth of the contents of this document. Then it will become an exhibit. Till then, why is it marked for uh, identification? Because you will need to identify it. You will have to say that on such and such date that other witness came and said this. Now what do you say about it? I say that I know the truth of the contents. Now exhibit. So marking for identification is not exhibiting a document. This is by and large what I wanted to say about proving facts. You prove facts by oral evidence. One such fact is the content of a document that you prove by producing the document or producing secondary evidence in certain situations by showing the handwriting, by proving the handwriting or proving the signature. That's only one kind of fact. That is a document is there that document was written, that document is genuine. That's it. Thank you very much, sir, Jaydeep, sir. Very nicely explained. In fact, I do doubt what law of facts. I have now crystal clear everything, how much seriously we have to apply our mind. Even the apply, apply quote also. I am very grateful. Uh, really you made a lot of research also very seriously. You made it a serious. Everyone is very seriously hearing you about this thing. Uh, it looks like very normal, but the way you explained and made it, uh, I'm very grateful to you, sir. Thank you very much.